uh, it's absorbed from 10,000 to 100,000 tons of carbon per year, carbon dioxide per year. So what if we took this burditite rock and turn it into artificial rock that works the same way and maybe we can make it better to work better. And we can take this artificial rock and build houses with it. So um, obviously you can't take rocks to spread rocks all around the world to protect, to absorb the carbon dioxide. So we, we decided we can uh, study these rocks and turn them into artificial rocks and then we can build houses with them. So here is our machine. This is um, the main machine. Uh, so as you can see, here is the rock, the burdite rock. And here is the solar cells. These solar cells does not work the usual way. Uh, it absorbs the carbon and the sunlight also and turn it into a heat energy and also a light energy. So as you can see here, for example, the house, here is the artificial rock, and uh, here is a protecting layer to protect the house from the inside, so there will be no leaking. But we have two problems. Problem number one, that this rock does not absorb the carbon directly, it absorbs the carbon dioxide, but that's okay. The second problem is we have to make a balance on producing and reducing the carbon, so many creatures need the carbon to live. We can't just take away the carbon, all of it. Now we have to think of a way to uh, produce the carbon and make a balance in this process. And um, this is what are we going to work on for the next week. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Elizy. That was very impressive. I appreciate that. Uh, so let's see, uh, Mike. Do you have any questions for 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 Aliazi and, and and her company? Sure. Um, so uh, look, I I love this idea. Um, the uh, the in, a, in an interview about uh, a month ago, Bill Gates uh, discussed the fact that we are going to be building the equivalent of New York City every month for the next 40 years in order to deal with global urbanization and the movement of people into cities and trying to figure out how to build with greener, better materials that are not just less impactful, but actually you know, benefit the earth uh, is, is, a, is, a, is, a great, is a great idea. Uh, one of the things that you'll want to think about uh, a, a little bit is also some of the, and I know this is gonna sound kind of strange, some of the chemistry of the absorption of CO2. This is a really important thing for us to do, um, but um, it, it's also very hard because normally it's quite slow. Uh, and, and so um, uh, thinking about, yeah, how do, how do, we, how do we you know, balance that process? How, how do we actually make that work? And while there are some natural rocks like you had, you had talked about that can turn it into calcite, right? a form of limestone, um, uh, that, that, and that can work really well, the rate at which it happens is something that, um, that you'll want to, to look at. But excellent presentation, really cool idea. I love it. Fantastic, that's great. And and one one question I have, uh, Ayazi, for for the environment, for the machine you're building. Have you started to think about how to measure the production, the reduction, and the increase of carbon because of different uh, elements of your process? Um, well, not yet, but we are going to work on this on that this week. Fantastic. That's great. I mean, you have time. You can you can do it between now and end of summer. But that's very important to to quantify that. It's if you can do it in the same simulation environment that you're showing is great. Sometimes the scales might be different. Then you can have a separate machine to do it. But but that's great. That's amazing. Fantastic. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank Stephanie, you so much. who's the next company? Thank you. Who's the next company? Next, we have the super capable team. Alva, please go ahead. Um, okay, so as Al Yazi said earlier, we're actually working with the Golden Ratio on these library parts. So 
we are actually trying to um, put these designs we made into Blender. And here are some examples made by one of our team members. So here it is. This is a cap. And here's another example. This is a t-shirt. And last but not least, we have a, what is it called? A hat. And uh, also we have something for carbon removal. This is one of our first machines we're gonna make for carbon removal, but hopefully we make many more to come. So, oh, sorry. Um, so in this story chip, it actually shows you the, an explanation of what this is. And it says that the red sphere is a, is a combination of zinc ions. The black spheres represent carbon and the white box is where carbon is transformed into uh, polyurethane. I still forgot how to pronounce that. Um, and it's used in clothing, packaging, and some other stuff. So yeah, it's a very valuable material. Let's play the machine. So carbon is actually attracted to these ions. And if we take these ions and put them out into the air and then bring them back and sequester the carbon, we can actually turn it into something much more useful which is extremely helpful in getting rid of carbon out of the air and you get something out of it as well, which you can sell in, um, in and then you can sell it so you can actually make money for research and um, getting those zinc metal ions in the air in the first place. And that is pretty much it for our company. Thank you. Fantastic, thank you. Mike, any Questions or comments? Look, I, I uh, much like much like for the last uh, for the last company, I, I love the chemistry, right? And um, and and that's going to be the um, the 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 thing that's going to drive any of these ideas. I, I think it's amazing um, how how uh, in tune you all are with the the underlying science and chemistry of what it takes to be a green company it's not about marketing it's not about feeling that's part of it yes but so much is about the the the, the chemistry the physics and in some cases as we'll talk about probably a little bit more the biology uh, of how this works um, one of the things that uh, you might want to also think about is of course when you do put the zinc out in order to um, in order to capture the carbon, the carbon dioxide from the air. When you collect all of that back, you're going to then have to strip the carbon dioxide back off in order to make polyurethane or any uh, long chain carbon molecule. And, and, and so how much energy does it take, because it will take energy, uh, in order to strip off all of that carbon from what we would call your catalyst, that zinc ion. Um, and, uh, and, and, and then where will that energy come from? Because obviously you don't want it to come from a carbon source because then you really haven't, you know, fixed the problem, so to speak. So, to speak. so you wanna make sure that that energy that you're gonna to use to clean or scrub your catalyst, the zinc, um, also is sourced from a renewable resource. Okay, interesting. We haven't thought about that yet. Fantastic. That's great. And, and, and uh, Ava, one, one thing which is uh, very interesting is you're showing right now the uh, uh, an atomic level uh, process in the simulation, which is great. Uh, think about that in the same machine, if in an area you're showing at one scale, which is atomic level, at another place, uh, another area in that machine, you can show the impact of that at the larger scale, like at the level of a city, for example. And you can put in your simulation, the ratios that, okay, if as atomic level it happens, and if you have this much of it in the city, what's the impact at the city level? So while you're on the simulation, while on one side it shows you the nanotechnology, on the other side it shows the impact at the uh, global level. So think about that kind of a presentation. Does that make sense, Ava? Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, we will do that. We'll add that to the machine later. Fantastic, thank you. That was great. So let's go next. Uh, who is the next company, Stephanie? Next we have the Samurais. 
Yes, this week we have been adding some features to our carbon removal project. So in our carbon removal project, there's a drone here and this drone is powered by solar panels. This drone also has a depth sensor. So after it reaches a certain height, here it is 40 units, it just makes sure it stays there. It also plants bamboo and water with the help of these two dispensers. I'll tell bamboo, why we chose bamboo in a few minutes. And now uh, it's ran out of bamboo. So I'm going to click on this land button. This will slowly land the drone. And then you can refill the seeds in it. The way the seed dispenser works is like this. So the seed drops on to this cogwheel here, which pushes it out. And then the water dispenser has a motor, which uh, works in this sort of mechanism. And then this bamboo, we planted all this bamboo for a biomass plant to generate electricity. So bamboo can, uh, bamboo has some unique properties that, plant, that trees don't have. So bamboo grows faster than most plants and it also releases 30% more oxygen. So uh, it's also cheaper. So that's why it's a great solution for carbon removal. So you can see here the bamboo, as it grows, it is trimmed. So bamboo is actually a grass. So you can trim the upper stalks of it without killing the plant. So that principle is used here. And then the upper stalks are stored in this facility. Then these upper stalks are heated up in this furnace. Initially, we thought of converting it to charcoal, but that produces carbon monoxide, which is again dangerous. So we switched back to just burning normal poles of bamboo. It also does not produce carbon monoxide. It heat, this is used as fuel to heat the steam on top, to heat the water on top, which converts to steam. And then this steam powers the turbine below it. Then the steam is uh, condensed and sent back to the water container. Meanwhile, this electricity is sent to the transformer outside, which increases the voltage. And it's sent to the grid and to all the houses. Now I'm going to show you the impact of the solution here. So you can see that uh, within just five years, it has reduced 40 tons of carbon dioxide. And that is with just 650 bamboo, which is less than an acre. For comparison, most coffee plantations are about two acres. So this is very less amount of bamboo and very huge amount of carbon dioxide. And that's it. Fantastic, thank you. Mike? Very interesting. I, I, I love biomass energy production. Um, and, uh, and, and, and that's so, I mean, that's, that's what you're focusing on, on here. The great thing about biomass energy production is that electricity, when we use it, of course, does not release any emissions. It's clean because it's not an energy source. It's an energy carrier, right? And, and so, uh, one of my questions in your carbon balance, so you're you're uh, growing the uh, you're you're growing the the bamboo, uh, and so that's absorbing CO two. When you burn the bamboo, you make sure that you count the CO two that comes off of the burning, right? Uh, yeah. and, and 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 so that way you know that way you're probably going to be have a, a pretty good balance between those two and then your reduction of co2 probably comes from not using coal or natural gas or anything else is that is that right yes so actually burning of the bamboo causes some production of carbon dioxide but it's mostly offset by the other bamboo in the impact machine which i showed actually the uh, the uh, factory was generating carbon dioxide, but mm -hmm. the, if you saw it, actually it was offset by the other bamboo. Yep, nope, that's that, that's exactly right. So you kind of have a, a a balance, right? Much the way that nature always works. 
One of the things you can also think about doing with the bamboo is, um, is making products. Uh, in addition to energy, making things like scaffolding for construction, making things like um, flooring. There's lots of uh, there's lots of things that we build with all of the time that can use bamboo that we don't burn then as an input. Uh, and so that's one way to also think about um, uh, even making that carbon balance even better. Because if we don't actually burn the bamboo to make energy, um, then then we then we get all of the benefit of growing the bamboo um, without any of the combustion. Oh, okay, that's a nice idea. We'll work on that. Fantastic. Uh, Jogan, that's great, uh, especially because you're showing different aspects of what you're doing. Uh, that's great. Can you, Jogan, mention what was the business model you had in mind also, such that Mike provides some input on that? You're on mute. Could you repeat that? I'm asking that, can you explain the business model you have in mind? That would be very good for Mike to give you some ideas and some feedback. How do you make money and how do you sustain the, the, mod, the system you're putting together? Yeah, so if uh, the cost of bamboos is actually very less, I'll just share my screen now. So here you can see the cost of bamboo here. So one cent costs three bamboo. 10 cents, you can buy 30 bamboo seeds. And with $1, you can buy 30 bamboo, 300 bamboo. So with this number of seeds, what uh, a, our company will do is, it's going to transform a coal plant into this biomass plant. So all you need to pay is a one-time amount, and then we will uh, uh, transform it by adding just a few features. Because only up till the transformer, it differs. After the transformer, it's probably almost the same. And then we also have different types of bamboo based on the location. So if you are in the USA, you have to use a Chesquia bamboo because it suits the climate. And if you are in South Africa or Kenya, you might have to use a Tamnocalamus uh, species of bamboo. And yes, that is... Uh, you add something about the ad model also. Can you mention that? Oh, that was a different one, actually. It was uh, about a different idea, which we did not like it now. Okay, so sorry about it. Don't worry. Don't worry about it. Mike, go ahead, please. No, uh, look, um, so uh, of, of course, any model by which you're going to be selling energy is always going to be a good business. Um, energy has always been a very good business. Um, you know, look how many energy companies are some of the biggest companies around the world. Um, so uh, your your business model, I, I I think I think can can work well, especially if we end up getting some kind of carbon price. Uh, that's going to be the most important thing uh, associated with your with your business model because there's a lot of costs in addition to of course the seeds um, that are going to go into such a thing. You know, when, when you talk about converting a coal power plant over to a bamboo plant, you're right that everything from the transformer down is exactly the same. Um, everything from the transformer up, it's actually very difficult to transfer that over because of the way that coal is burned. Um, uh, it, it's not like a, a fire where we would normally put it in like uh, stacks of wood uh, and, and burn it in a coal fired power plant. It's pulverized. It, it's actually a, quite a, a very specific process. So it's a lot more expensive than you might think to transition over such a power plant, but it certainly can be done. And you're exactly right. From the transformer on, exactly the same. That's a really good thing. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, Stephanie. And next we have the Grand Poly Innovators. Please go ahead.
sorry, we can't hear you. Hello, everyone. I have prepared new chips for this week. Let's uh, look at the slides now. Uh, musical instruments library. I think that music chips are very important for you. We can create a new library. This library includes classical guitar, electric guitar, violin, piano, drum set, saxophone, and art. I'm a musician, guitarist. I would like to see music chips in Pali. I won't start placing the international co guitar competition. Uh, let's look at musical instruments chips. Classical guitar. Electric guitar. Well. Grand piano. Drum set. Saxophone and art. Thank you to everyone. So that, that, that was great, Adash. That's very, very good idea. I want to let you know that there is one other company, I think uh, Innovation Sultans, that they had some early work on how to add sound chips to Polyop is actually is not a chip is an operator, which means that in any chip can get used. And there are some of the team members there that they have talked about. They are actually do piano. Uh, they, they're they're, they're uh, focused on piano and they want to add music. So I'll, I'll make sure to connect you together such that you can join forces and work on the music and sound addition. It's very important is the almost most asked feature that right now doesn't exist how to add the sound algorithmically and how to be able to make music algorithmically inside the simulation environment great idea thank you so stephanie can we go to the thank next you. next we have the world poly innovators Hello, this week I made a prototype for a carbon purifier. The device I'm talking about is a new device. device. For now, I'll, uh, I'll showing you a prototype of this device. And next week, I'll uh, show you a polyp machine uh, with this device. We are working on it. We built the device uh, in polyp. I'm demonstrating the prototype now. Sorry, we don't see your uh, screen if you're sharing and we don't see your uh, your stream also. If you can share your camera would be good. And share your camera also, sorry. Go ahead, please. I'm prototype of carbon prefer. Uh, I wrote about uh, it here. We know uh, that the population is constantly growing. As the population uh, grows, so does carbon. It is impossible uh, to reduce uh, the population. I prefer a, a device uh, for this. This device will take carbon from the atmosphere and release oxygen uh, into the air. How it works? This device will attract uh, air. The air will be shot of uh, on all sides. Then uh, the air is released into the device at the temperature below uh, minus seventy-eight point five Celsius. And this is due uh, to the drop solidification of carbon dioxide at temperatures below uh, minus. 78.5 Celsius. And then the device collects the salt carbon in a box. The last is perfect uh, oxygen into the air. I think that uh, if this re the device is used in every home, the air will be cleaned. We know that carbon uh, has both advantages and disadvantages. For example, uh, fuel is also used in oil production. I do not uh, pay much attention for planting trees because uh, plants 
and do not return carbon. But the device I am uh, talking about collects carbon, and then this carbon can be transferred to the oil file. People will be a uh, hazard if carbon clean it. People will live uh, longer. I think we built this device on a poly machine. Uh, temperature attack the atmosphere, uh, spreads the atmosphere around. And uh, what device uh, is this? I will fix this in polya. Uh, great, thank you. Can you please mention from what country are you uh, yourself? Uh, country Azerbaijan. You're from Azerbaijan, fantastic. Um, Mike, please go ahead. Yeah, um, the uh, the collection of carbon from the atmosphere is is one of our global challenges and absolutely a a uh, uh, one of the things we see as a, a a very very important technology to combating climate change. Um, one of the things that I think you'll want to think about is where the energy comes from in order to get the temperature down to minus 79 C. Uh, to cool something down to that low level uh, takes a lot of energy. Uh, and, and, and so if that energy, of course, comes from fossil fuels or natural gas, then we just now have a carbon cycle. Um, if it comes from wind, if it comes from other types of renewables, then it's possible. But trying to understand um, a little bit about how much energy it will take to cool something to that level, I think will actually give you a, a, good, a good idea of how much energy you're going to need to produce or, or buy or use in order to make this work. It's, it's a great idea to do um, carbon capture and sequestration which is what we call this. Um, uh, we all just have to balance sort of that entire process. So wonderful idea. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, great. Uh, Stephanie, please go ahead next. Next, we have the technological future. Please go ahead. Okay, Aisha has a problem. Uh, no problem, no problem, Aisha, try to fix it. Do we have anybody more, Stephanie, or was that last one? That was the last speaker for today. Okay, so Aisha, you try to fix your problem and whenever you are ready, we can, we can do that. Uh, so let's, uh, let's uh, transition to Mike, if you would like to give us some uh, overview, and then we'll have some question and answer. That would be great. Please go ahead. Thank you. Sure. You know, especially with regard to um, uh, to the kinds of to many of the kinds of companies that we were talking about today that have a focus on um, sustainability, global climate change, um, uh, things like this. Um, I think it might be helpful and useful to, to talk about a couple of different things that could be interesting uh, for, for you. So the first is, make this big and we'll make this small. Um, the, the first, is uh, the notion of process flow diagrams. And what this is, is an idea where we will, where we will outline the specific product that we want, very much like you do in, in polyop, but, and, and then specifically, for your machines, diagram every single step along the way of producing, you know, whether it's changing from CO2 in the air to CO2 in a solid, 
much like we heard from the last presentation. But not only looking at it from that direction, but also asking how much energy needs to go into each one of these steps, because that's an important part. And does that energy then lead to its own CO2 emissions? How much material do you need to use? Do you need to use you know, zinc, as we saw in one of the examples? Where does that zinc go? Do we reclaim that zinc? And how much energy does it take to clean it? And so the idea of process flow diagrams can be really important, not just how your product moves through the manufacturing chain, but also understanding all of the inputs. And if in fact there are wastes or other emissions coming out, how do we count for those as well? Because the reason we're in this climate change problem to begin with is we tended to think too much about these processes, only the ones that we were in control of, and we forgot to think about a lot of these other processes when we talk about sustainability. And how, if possible, do we make all of this circular in nature? The other concept that I think may be very helpful for you to think about as you're thinking about your companies and any ideas for companies like this is an equation that I like to teach to my students on the first day and it's a very simple equation called IPAT. So what is IPAT? Well, IPAT says that impact, right? In this case, let's say it's kilograms of CO2 is a function of population Okay, so that's how many people you have, which as somebody said before, that's kind of hard to change. Times affluence. This is a function of consumption. How much do the people that are living in your nation, in your city, in your state, on the globe, how much do they want to consume? How many miles a year do they want to drive? How many kilometers a year do they want to fly? How many prepackaged dinners and snacks do they want to eat or how much naturally grown food do they eat? As people tend to get richer and more affluent, they tend to create more impact. Times technology. And this is where many of you are focused. We can definitely design the technologies to let people live more affluently with less impact if we can be creative, and if we can be really, really specific. So as we think about different, as we, as we think about different businesses that can, that can start to address sustainability, you can think about businesses that yes, create new technologies that create less impact, but you can also create businesses that help people live in a really great lifestyle with less impact by allowing them to live affluently in a very, very high quality of life with less impact as well, so that we can indeed meet the demands of our entire population. So I wanted to just say a few short words about those two concepts that I think can be really helpful as you think about your overall, um, your overall business, uh, business ideas. So um, uh, Hamid, was that, uh, was that a good um, way to kind of uh, uh, contextualize some of, the, some of the things that we're talking about? Yeah, that was fantastic. Really, really appreciate it, especially both aspects that you said. I think the, the process is critical. And uh, one of the things that I suggest the, the companies start to think about is they, the advantage they have is they can capture that conceptual process that you were mentioning actually inside their simulation because they can show that you know, separately as a process, they can show input and output to boxes and they can put the equation between them and show it. And that process can reflect in that uh, equation that you put in to do the calculation. Exactly. So one of the advantages here is how to have a holistic view 
of what you're doing at different scale from those technologies, which is more details and the mechanism of what you do to mm-hmm. how it comes up and then multiply by population, multiply by affluence, as you're saying, and what's the total, uh, total amount. I think that's fantastic model to think about. Well, and, and, it also, and it also talks about, yes, I know we love to talk about technology, but it also talks about personal choices the way that we choose to live, how affluently we choose to live, how many, you know, do we choose to drive a car or ride a bike? Do we choose to have a really big house? Do we choose to have a smaller house? Uh, Those are personal choices. And so as we think about businesses, um, we can also help people make really great choices, make a lot of money as well, but by about allowing to do things in different way. You know, I mean, you ask a great question. Um, Lots of people talking about climate change. Some do it as taking action in global warming, but again, global warming is still increasing. It's a problem. What's the main reason for this? It's very hard for people to give up that affluent lifestyle. We, 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 around the world, we, the, the, the rich countries have come to expect a certain level of lifestyle that's supported by lots of carbon emissions. Around the world, developing countries are aspiring, rightfully so, to that same level of consumption because it's it's something that is enjoyable. And so without this commitment to, to all recognizing that we're in this together, uh, it is a very, very difficult challenge. But we have actually come together as a globe in previous types of challenges like this to successfully overcome them. We did it together with ozone depletion when we had the ozone hole before, um, uh, probably before you were born. But you know, this is something that we can do um, if we work together on it, for sure. Fantastic. Great. A- anybody else? Any other? Uh, uh, anybody else has any question that want to raise? So, Mike, I, I have two questions. Uh, okay, Noel, do you want to go ahead, share, share your screen and, and go ahead, please? I mean, share your video and go ahead, please. Um, Hello, my name is Noel and I have a question. My question is, global warming is not only caused by greenhouse fumes. Um, Things we do every single day, like lighting a match, starting a campfire, a barbecue can also contribute a lot. Do you think that people are ready to accept that they can't live in the way they're living because the world is dying every day and people aren't really taking a change of that? Yeah, it's very hard to get people to accept that life will have to change. Uh, And and that's why in many regards, I'm really hopeful that you all can help us understand this. The other thing I would say is on the bright side, you know, we had had heard um, that bamboo can be one way to produce electricity with maybe a less impactful type of thing. Electric barbecues work really well. Shifting over to electricity, where we can produce electricity through non-combustible gases um, is is a really great way to be able to do this. We're also looking at lots of new types of ways to get energy that are not carbon producing, like geothermal, bringing the heat from the center of the earth, um, uh, and advanced, um, advanced solar and advanced wind. And so, You know, uh, there are other technologies. It just takes a commitment, takes a lot of money, and it takes some innovation to get there. Uh, And and, and there are ways to do it. Um, If I knew the answer, Noel, I would gladly share it with you. But this is a very difficult problem because you've got got the technology, you've got the policy, the things that governments do, you've got economics, and you've got people's preferences. Um, And so... uh, so another question, uh, while global warming is destroying the world, you say, then why are we using money to go to Mars instead of fixing the Earth? Uh, you know, this is, this, is a, 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 this is a good question. Um, I would also say in, in that regard, it doesn't have to be an either or. Uh, there is plenty of money for both of them. Um, uh, I, I, I would say an equally good question is why fight war? and spend money on war if we have to fight climate change. So actually, 
I do a lot of work on, um, on, uh, on space exploration and trying to understand new technologies for space exploration. And you may ask, Noel, why do I do that? Well, the reason that I do it is when, and when we go to the moon for exploration purposes, I need to create buildings that run on zero fossil fuels, because we have no fossil fuels on the moon, that create no waste, because we have no landfills and that we have everything there that we need because we can't take anything with us. It is a truly a closed like little system. And so the way I think about it is if I can create technologies that work in that environment, I know they will be really great here on Earth to fix our problems. And I use the sort of the challenge of, of space um, to, uh, to, to, to actually create better technologies here. Some of our best innovations have come from space exploration and the challenges that space gives us. And we now use them every day in our lives, like microwave ovens. Right? We needed a way to, 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 to heat something up without a flame because we can't do that in space. That's really dangerous because of the levels of oxygen. So we created a way to not have to use a barbecue or a flame to heat things up. Uh, and so that's that's why we often will we'll do that. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you. Jagan, can you please go ahead? Yes. Do you think biomass energy production could replace other modes of electricity production? Could people's affluence affect this idea? So I think biomass will be part of the solution. I don't think it's going to be the entire solution. And the reason I say that, Jagan, is if you do a calculation for how much biomass we would need to produce to replace fossil fuels around the world, we would need to use all of our land around the entire world just to produce enough biomass for energy production. That would not leave enough land for us to produce food and for us to live on and for us to do other things. And so therefore, while it's going to be part of the energy transformation, it can't be all of it. There will be other really great technologies, but that's okay because the solution to all of these global problems does not have to be one single solution. It will be a mix of really great ideas. Uh, and I do, I think biomass will be one of them. Absolutely. Fantastic, thank you. And Noel has one last question. She promises the last one. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I see. No, Noel's question around the poverty line and how do people below the poverty line adapt to the new normal if it ever happens? Noel, you ask very good questions. Um, uh, you know, when it comes to thinking about sustainability, we think about it in three different very important ways. One is economics. And that's much of what you're learning through polio, right? Is that the, an economic model has to exist for people to do things. Uh, everybody has to engage in, uh, in, an, in, 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 in an economy in an empowering way. We think about environmental impact, right? CO2, water consumption, pollution, things like this. But we also must think about equity and social impacts and making sure that everyone gets to participate in, a, in, in, in what will be the new economy and the new world that you all are creating. And so while I do not have a good answer to your very good question, um, the fact that you're asking the question is incredibly important because for too long, we did not think about things like that. And so for you, to positively consider it is really important. I wish I had a good answer, but just because I'm a college professor does not mean I know everything. Uh, and this is one that I do not know the answer to. I'm hoping you do. Fantastic, thank you, really appreciate it. And, and I hope that those questions that we don't know the answer, this, this kids here are going to be the pioneers to actually come with the answer and give it give it to us you know so us, us old people do not know the answers to most of the very hard questions if we did we would have done it many years ago 
Fantastic. <laughs> but but you, you can you can solve these problems and, and look forward to the to the innovative ideas you bring in and actually make happen. You know, ideas alone don't matter. Ideas in action are what matters. So you know how to put it in place, uh, all the kids here. Fantastic. Awesome. Uh, Mike, one one other question. I mean, we, we it become a tradition that we ask those that come. Uh, is it especially with, with the fantastic inputs that you had in what they're focusing on in carbon removal, is it uh, okay if they consider you as an advisor to their companies and in a way that doesn't take too much of your time to ask you questions going forward? Well, sure. Some mechanism. Sure. Um, and, uh, but, but, but I, yes, I, I would say that uh, it's hard for me to respond to tons and tons of inquiries and questions, but I'm, I'm happy to help in whatever ways that I can. Fantastic. Well, well we are putting some uh, structure together that uh, those that become advisors very little time in a month, like, you know, maybe uh, half an hour, take their time to just answer a set of questions we compile and provide. But we really appreciate, Mike, this was amazing. My pleasure. Uh, you know, it, it was so timely. They are getting ready for next week to present their carbon removal uh, solution to CEO of XPRIZE, which has Elon Musk carbon removal. Mm -hmm. So it was very, very timely and highly appreciated. It was very fun. Thank My you. Uh, thanks, everybody. We are at the end of the session today. Get ready for next week. Uh, this week would be very busy and, and uh, many of the students now that are in the summer time and they have more time to put is it goes well with with the need we have right now to be ready for next week thanks everybody have a great day and night those of you that want to talk to muhammad on the design side can can remain here and continue uh and thank you we'll see you next week next week by the way on on saturday we're going to have a session we'll not have a speaker we're going to get ready and monday we'll have uh, we'll have the CEO of XPRIZE would be here and, and you're going to uh, pitch your ideas and ask your questions. But we'll have, have a still the Saturday, go through uh, a practice and make sure you're ready. So I'll see you all on Saturday. Thank you. Have a great day and night. Mike, thanks a lot again. My pleasure.